I know you guys value the show and you might be surprised to know there are eight to 10,000 regular listeners like yourself. If you do enjoy the show and find it of interest, why not support the show via Patreon or PayPal? A small recurring donation helps me. I not only do this because I enjoy it, but this is my job. I don't make a lot, but I love what I do and the support from you guys and the people I've talked to has encouraged me to return to university in September to undertake a history master's degree. So why not help me improve the podcast for you and show your support by going to patreon.com slash ww2podcast or for further details go to the website ww2podcast.com. Hello and welcome. In this episode, we're looking at the role of the Red Cross throughout the Second World War and immediately after. I'm joined by Gerald Steinacker. Gerald is Associate Professor of History and Hyman Rosenberg Professor of Judaic Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His new book is Humanitarians at War, The Red Cross in the Shadow of the Holocaust. Thanks for joining me. Um, I think if we're talking about the Red Cross the starting point must be to understand why it came about uh, and what it was set up to do, because that very much affects how it operated during World War II. So the beginnings in the 1850s, 60s in Europe as a project by private citizens, basically, to uh, help wounded soldiers in the field and make their life and, and their suffering, so to, uh, so to speak, better. Th- that, that's the beginning, very humble beginning of the Red Cross. And it was a Swiss citizen, Rodino, who had this idea because he witnessed the battle in northern Italy. And then he founded this private institution that eventually turned into the International Committee of the Red Cross, with headquarters in Geneva in Switzerland, This ICSC was basically copied in other countries. And from that on, we have a number of national Red Cross societies who were uh, formed or uh, founded in the 1870s, 1880s, all over Europe and the Americas first. And then it spread all over the world. But the idea was to reduce the suffering of soldiers in the field, to help wounded soldiers and then later prisoners of war as well after the First World War especially. But initially, it was not intended to help or to bring relief to civilians. This is very important when talking about the Holocaust. Well, the First World War must have been their first really major testing of, 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 of them as an organisation. How did they perform? Did they, did they start to make any changes at the First World War, or did they come out of it slapping themselves on the back on the work that they'd done? The First World War was certainly the first major test for this organization because just the the amount of the war and the length of the war and the millions of people involved. The ICSC and the National Red Cross organizations were very successful, actually, in uh, making sure there is a minimal standard of respect between the fighting powers when it comes to respecting hospitals, respecting wounded soldiers, not firing, not shooting at hospitals, not shooting at uh, Red Cross workers and so on. And that was something that was really, that really worked very well. And what the Red Cross did in addition, for the first time, in addition to taking care of wounded soldiers, was also taking care of prisoners of war because for in the First World War, there were millions of prisoners of war on all sides, and the Red Cross started to take care of these groups as well. And um, after the First World War, with the Geneva Convention, in, in this new international treaty, um, how warfare is to be conducted in 1929, they also included the protection of prisoners of war as one of the uh, areas where the Red Cross would be active. The, the Red Cross were behind the original Geneva Conventions, weren't they? Yes, I think the Geneva Convention is something that people normally don't think about. When when I talk to people in the United States about the Red Cross, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the American Red Cross, the National Red Cross, and blood donations and disaster relief. Very few people have heard, ever heard about the Geneva Convention, at least in the United States, not very well known. 
And the Geneva Conventions really uh, were a product uh, or were the initiative of this original International Committee of, uh, of the Red Cross in Switzerland. The idea was to have a document that basically defines minimal standards of warfare. So what is allowed in war and what is not allowed. And uh, in the first Geneva Conventions, they tried to protect the wounded soldiers. And then later, they included also the protections of prisoners of war. For example, it is a war crime if you take a prisoner of, of war and after you take him or her prisoner, you shoot them. Uh, that's a clear violation of the Geneva Convention. There's the minimal standards for how much food prisoners of war should get, how they should be sheltered, how much medical care they should get, that they were allowed to write letters to their loved ones, and so on and so on. There are all kinds of regulation how to treat wounded soldiers and prisoners of war, uh, thanks to the Geneva Conventions. Civilians are not mentioned. It, is li it, it was literally a, a rule book for fighting f from a military point of view. Absolutely. It was all about soldiers. It was all about men and women in uniform. And civilians were basically uh, not protected or very little by these Geneva Convention. That was not the main uh, job of the Red Cross organizations in wartime at all. You've alluded to, to it already that um, the structure of the International Committee of the Red Cross, that is actually only an umbrella organization, isn't it? So from that, each, nation, each nation has its own association. That's correct. That's actually very confusing <laughs> because the original Red Cross organization, um, the first one um, was the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICIC, as I said, home based in Geneva, Switzerland. This organization is basically the, not just the oldest Red Cross organization, but also the, the protector of Geneva Conventions and the international standards of humanitarian Law. There are many other Red Cross organizations who came later. Those are the national Red Cross organizations, but they have a different status. They are not the promoters of the Geneva Conventions of international law for for warfare. Uh, it's it's really to this very day that the ICSC has a very very special status. It's also traditionally the ICSC, the mother organization, so to speak, in Geneva who recognizes new Red Cross organizations. For example, if a new nation is born, Slovakia or Croatia or whatever, then they have a new Red Cross organization of this nation. And traditionally, it was the ICSC recognizing the national Red Cross organization. So inside the Red Cross family, with all these many national Red Cross organizations, the ICSC always had a special status. So uh, how autonomous are the national associations? The national organizations, just when we look at the time when they were founded or were, when they came into existence, it was in the late 19th century uh, in Europe and, and beyond. And that was a time, of course, of very strong nationalism. And these Red Cross organizations basically from the very beginning lost their independence and autonomy and became kind of more or less uh, a, a national organization to a large degree controlled by the national governments. It's, 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 a, good, it's a good grounding for understanding it, what really went on during the war is, is all that. Because if we look at the run up to the war, if we're looking at from when Hitler comes to power, um, once the Germans, the Nazis start persecuting the Jews uh, why was the Red Cross reticent to speak out? I think two major reasons one the ICSC who is uh, in you know in a wider sense also a guardian of humanitarian laws of, of humanity if, if you wish they had very few legal tools because the Geneva Convention at the time would not protect civilians and certainly not protect civilians in peacetime. So what the German government was doing in the 1930s with its own citizens of Jewish background, treating them like second and third class citizens, and then eventually objecting them also to violence, physical violence, and imprison them in concentration camps, 
this was considered at the time as basically an internal affair of Germany and the ICSC, although they wanted to do something about it and they reached out and they tried to intervene and they were eager to assist uh, these German Jewish civilians and also political prisoners, of course, in Nazi Germany, they could not do very much. They could do some, not very much. And the other problem was that the German National Red Cross organization was soon completely Nazified. The leadership was basically tough, hardcore Nazis. So the president, de facto president of the German Red Cross was a high-ranking SS officer and a war criminal himself. His uh, character is very prominently uh, shown in, uh, in the famous movie, The Downfall, in the scene where SS officer uses hand grenades under the table of, of the family dining room and his children and his wife was just, you know, trying to start eating and he was uh, killing them all. He was blowing himself up with hand grenades and that was the head of the German Red Cross because he was well aware of the fact that he committed war crimes to a massive extent and that the Soviets would probably execute him. So the German Red Cross was completely in line very soon with the regime and they were not willing to help uh, the Jewish citizens or the, 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 Jews, uh, the German Jewish citizens. Was the International Red Cross aware of what was, was it fully aware of what was going on in the lead up to the war? Yes, the ICSC uh, was always very well informed. It had its delegates basically all over the globe who reported the ICSC had also good ties with uh, diplomats, especially Swiss diplomacy. I mean, it, to a certain extent, uh, it was a Swiss organization. It was based in Switzerland. And uh, very often, Swiss diplomats and Swiss career politicians would be, for a while at least in their career, presidents, serve as presidents of the ICSC as well. So the Red Cross, the ICSC, had all kinds of very reliable sources about what was going on in the world and what was going on in Nazi Germany. And particular, its vice president and later president, Karl Jakob Burkhardt, had top connections with the German leadership, with the Nazi German leadership. And he knew very early on about the Nazi uh, German plan to murder all European Jews. This connection with the Swiss government, you know, Switzerland was obviously neutral and neut neut neutrality is a uh, sort of a, 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 an elastic situation as it happens. Now, I wondered, I wondered when, you know, Switzerland is surrounded essentially by hostile parties that post you know, the fall of France, they're all Axis controlled or Axis countries. Now, I wondered if 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 you thought that uh, that the Swiss government and the International Red Cross felt it was within their interests not then to speak out <laughs> for for their own good um, as as a as a neutral independent country. Yeah, I think that's more or less what happened. There was a huge pressure from the government of uh, Switzerland on the ICSC, but also inside the ICSC consideration that uh, Switzerland is not in a pr uh, situation to provoke the German tiger. yeah, And they have to be very careful because a German invasion is certainly possible. And they were very dependent on fascist Italy and Nazi Germany and completely surrounded by Axis powers. So they, they had uh, very little options at the time. And um, I think the ICSC leadership, of course, knew very well what the situation is and understood that the Swiss government did not want to provoke Germany, for example, by uh, protesting or issuing a public statement about uh, the persecution of Jews and, and the mass murder and genocide that's going on that's uh, perpetrated by Nazi Germany at the time. So while there were many people tried to help in the ICSC, at the same time, they knew that they're in a very difficult situation and the pressure was enormous, no doubt about that. And traditionally, the ICSC, although it was not always in line with the Swiss government, it was often seen as an instrument 
of Swiss foreign policy to do Swiss foreign policy with uh, humanitarianism, with humanitarian aid. And uh, that there was a strong link between the, the Swiss government and the ICC. And as I said earlier, I mean, it also shows when you look at the leadership of the ICSC, Iman Burkhardt, who was vice president from vice president of the ICSC and then later president, after he gave up his uh, well, in forty five he became a Swiss ambas- ambassador in Paris, and he was the ambassador of Switzerland in Paris, France, while he was still at the same time president of the ICSC. There was a clear uh, uh, overlap here between these functions and. It was not clearly separated. It's almost unthinkable, that kind of thing, from today's perspective. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's even more surprising to hear and to read about all these claims that were made at the time, and then, of course, after 1945, after the war, that the ICSC was completely neutral and independent from the Swiss government. That's just not true. That's just not true. I mean, um, that that that's that doesn't reflect the the historical record at all. I wondered as well if because obviously the, sh- the shining light of the Red Cross, possibly arguably during the the bulk of the war years, must have been the uh, prisoners of war parcel scheme. And I wondered if for that reason that caused other decisions to be made because you, that, that that didn't want to be jeopardised. Because uh, that really was helping millions of incarcerated soldiers on all sides. Yes, that's a very important point. The ICSC and also national Red Cross organization organizations could do a lot to protect and to help and to provide food to millions of prisoners of war, especially from Western nations, also from the Western allies. That's, of course, not so much true for prisoners of war from the Soviet Union or for German prisoners of war in the Soviet Union, or uh, prisoners of war in Japanese captivity. There, the record is, is very different, but that's not the fault of the ICSC. There were limits and limitations because uh, some of these nations did not ratify, did not support the Geneva Conventions, and so the ICSC had no legal basis to operate there. But when it comes to Canadian and British and American prisoners of war, the Red Cross uh, certainly uh, uh, was able to help those. And and it's also thanks to the Red Cross in part, certainly, that most of these American, British and, and Canadian and others prisoners of war survived the war. Because in those cases, they were treated fairly and the Geneva Convention was more or less respected in those areas. The, the Red Cross was on safe ground. So the Red Cross is on safe <laughs> ground and they knew that, you know, they had to make a difficult decision. If they help the, the prisoners of war, then it's part of their job. It's, it's part of their treaty, that contract they have, the Geneva Convention, as you say, solid ground, yeah helping civilians in concentration camps or ghettos there was no uh, there was no legal basis really for that and um, they couldn't do very much from their point of view certainly yeah so if, we, if we're looking at civilians i guess we start to get displaced people from uh the fall of poland and then uh fall of france uh, your people start to be uh displaced throughout europe and obviously towards the end of the war uh, as the close of the world, we find there's millions of people displaced. Um, when did they start to reach out and help refugees and displaced people? Was it just towards the end of the war? To a limited extent from the very beginning, they tried to provide, for example, food parcels for for refugees in refugee camps. And then versus the end of the war, the ICSC ICSC became always more active in trying to help um, refugees as well. But immediately after the war, there were other international organizations like the International Refugee Organization. They were set up by the Allies who would basically carry the main responsibility for those millions of displaced persons stranded in, in various parts of Europe, including the survivors of the Holocaust. And the Red Cross, also given its limited resources at the time and its weak legal status when it came to refugee uh, aid, uh, 
uh, focused on on groups and and um, yeah, on groups of refugees who were not so much supported from the Allies, uh, such as such as ethnic Germans expelled from Eastern Europe or uh, members of the defeated nations like Hungarians or Romanians. Those refugees um, could only receive limited aid from the Allies and then the Red Cross was focused on those. Because of this humanitarian emergency, they saw there is need. The international community is not, not helping those people, those groups so much. So based on neutral humanitarianism and this humanitarian emergency, with our limited resources, we try to help there somewhat. Yeah, this will get this idea of humanity without limits. They'll they'll help everybody equally. <laughs> How? Because as part of this refugee aid, the ICRC issued travel documents. Because that's of course a cheap way to help refugees. You know, you have lost all your documents. You have nothing with you. You cannot go back where you came from. Uh, you were expelled or whatever, and you want to start from scratch somewhere else in a new country overseas. So, and if you're in Europe, you need travel papers. And so that was a cheap way to help out refugees. And the ICSC introduced these travel papers. And because these expelled ethnic Germans and uh, members of defeated nations who found themselves also stranded in, in Central Europe, they had no one else helping them and issuing uh, travel documents. The Allies would not help them, would not issue travel documents for those groups so the Red Cross uh, did that for them the problem was that among those refugees there were a significant number of Holocaust perpetrators former Nazis and fascists who used this simple method to get travel documents from the International Red Cross to escape from justice basically. Did they have any legal authority to issue these documents and did these documents carry any authority anywhere? Well, as I said, it was a very chaotic situation. The Red Cross, like so many other refugee or aid organizations at the time, improvised to, to a certain extent. And initially, these travel documents had uh, basically very little uh, legal value, but they were recognized always more by a number of countries. So they were recognized by countries like Argentina and many South American countries, some um, African nations, some uh, nations in the Near and Middle East. If they recognized those documents, people, of course, could travel with these documents to those destinations. And over time, the Red Cross documents were recognized also by the international community. Were they aware of uh, the uh, problems with their documents, their, their lacks um uh, way of checking people's credentials, how it might come back at them. It, it became very clear basically from the very beginning and we, we noticed from the internal communication of the ICSC that there is a problem that people abuse those documents because there was basically no screening. There was no check who you are, what your background is, if you are um, a Nazi on the run or if you're just uh, ordinary you know, citizen, a refugee who lost everything or Holocaust survivor or ethnic German expelled. So the Red Cross never really did any screenings and that opened the door uh, very wide. So Nazis on the run, Holocaust perpetrators very soon realized that's an easy way to get to new documents because the Red Cross did not do any screenings. While the Allies, when they issued documents to refugees, they did very, very severe screening, so and they did a very good job. So they discovered black sheep easily. The Allies, the International Refugee Organization, for example, issuing travel documents, but the Red Cross did not, and the Red Cross did not because it didn't have the resources. But even more important, based on its own principles, the principle of neutral humanity. So. Uh, and, and neutral humanitarianism. If somebody comes to me and says, I'm a victim, I, I suffered, I need your help, the Red Cross helped. It surprised me that at the end of the war, when they're doing this, that they can see the problems and that they didn't try to tighten it up or do something because the potential public relations disaster, if it got out, that 
because everyone was kind of aware of what was going on. And I'm quite surprised that the Allies hadn't stopped it because yes. they were aware that it was being abused. Yes, the Allies were aware by the end of '46, basically, only after a yeah, little bit more than a year, you know, that, that these papers were issued. They were very well aware. The State Department in the United States, for example, but also the Italian government, the Swiss government, uh, and so on. And uh, there were a number of incidents where you could read about those troubled papers used by Nazis and SS members in newspapers at the time. So it was not a secret and the State Department uh, approached also the leadership of the ICSC and told them in '47 that they should really try to stop issuing these trouble papers because they could be this could be a, a serious problem and that could damage their reputation. Uh, 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 another thing about this close of the war period, I wondered if the Red Cross has sort of almost gone into overdrive feeling more secure with their borders so they start to go beyond their remit which is essentially you know their remit is 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 not set out to look after civilians and issue travel documents and i wondered if you know they almost go into overdrive to make up for what they might feel that they should have been doing during the war years i think that's a fair description uh, i think you're right on <laughs> that that's my impression too that that there is a certain need, it seems, to make up for shortcomings during the war, especially for civilians. And all these very busy activities in all areas where they previously were not so much uh, active in, and, and the creativity also, uh, the travel papers, for example, show that, points in that direction. I mean, one thing is, is, uh, is also important to keep in mind, the ICSC in 1945 did not look very strong. It, it, it was really an uh, institution, a humanitarian organization in crisis, in a massive crisis on many levels. It was basically bankrupt. It had very little resources. It had a leadership crisis. Uh, the president, Kalyako Bokad, at the time said, well, there is no future of this organization. That's a sinking ship. I, I go back into Swiss uh, politics and I'm going to be a diplomat for the Swiss government because there is no future for me here uh, with the ICSC and the reputation was also not ideal and there was a lot of critique you know by its handling of, of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust what happened during the Holocaust and so on together of course with a strong critique versus Switzerland and its neutrality or its definition of neutrality during the war. So many nations, uh, fighting nations after the war, criticized Switzerland heavily. And together with Switzerland, the ICSC was under attack as well. So in that situation, I think the ICSC tried to show that it still has something to offer, that it can improve itself, that it can be uh, useful still for the future, for a post-war uh, world. And, and that explains, I think, this very the, this 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 hectic almost activity in all kinds of areas, but then especially in reforming the Geneva Convention, I think that was also something that they really were were very keen to 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 put in place to show that they are still needed, that they can contribute something in the time of new organization, new world order, United Nations organizations specifically created for humanitarian help purposes, like. United Nations High Commission for Refugees, for example, High Commission for Refugees, for example. That was my next question. Was because you think it, it, the, the, their push for reform of the Geneva Convention was sort of in it, it, to try and keep them relevant? What what did they feel needed changing uh, from well, 1929? I think was that is that right? With the, the, the last uh, amendments had been made. So uh, in 1929, after the First World War. The new experiences with the many millions of prisoners of war were basically enshrined in law in 1929. So the very detailed protections of prisoners of war. What is expected from a nation, you know, who has uh, soldiers of an enemy nation in captivity? What is the minimal standard for food, for housing, for clothing, for everything? Of course, also the banning of torture of prisoners of war and all those things. 
but it was not about civilians. And because of the experience, also of the experience of the Second World War and the Holocaust, uh, the new Geneva Convention of 1949 then included protection of civilians during wartime. That's the big the big push to have it added in. Yeah, the Russians, the Russians resisted. Yeah, the Russians, uh, or the Soviets better, they were very, uh, they were very critical of Switzerland <laughs> and um, the ICRC. They didn't make really a, a distinction between the ICRC and Switzerland. For the Soviets, from their point of view, it was the same thing. And um, they, they accused the Swiss of being pro-fascists and being puppets of the Nazis and profiteers from the war and so on and so on. And they also uh, accused the ICSC particularly to not having done anything to help and protect the Soviet prisoners of war in German captivity. I mean, we should not forget that almost three million of Soviet prisoners of war died in German captivity. Many of them starved to death. On purpose, they were murdered basically uh, systematically by the Nazi authorities, starved to death or shot right away. Uh, and and the Soviets were eager to point at that and say, "Well, what did the Red Cross do?" And that was a little bit hypocritical because the Soviet Union did not ratify the Geneva Convention, uh, and it also did not, I mean, treated the German prisoners of war also um, in, in in horrible ways. Did the Red Cross actually make any attempts to help the Russian prisoners of war during the war? It did. Or how much attempts was made? It did. And a number of times it, they reached out. They tried to have a conversation with the Soviet government uh, again and again. And um, they, they helped Soviet prisoners of war where they could, for example, in Finland. During the, the Soviet-Finnish war, the Soviet prisoners of war in Finland got uh, some support from the ICSC because they could operate in Finland, but they could not operate on the territory of the Soviet Union. I was just thinking that the, the Russians would have to provide the parcels for the Russian prisoners of war, wouldn't they? So without that, it's not as if the Red Cross had a deep, endless funds to buy three million Russians food. I, I believe it was set up so the Russians would have to either, would have to somehow provide food parcels to give give to the Russian soldiers. So without the Russians providing the International Red Cross with those food parcels, there's nothing for them to give to those Russian prisoners. That's true. Food was was crucial and the money would come from the national governments, of course, yeah, uh, for the interest of their soldiers or their prisoners or prisoners of war. Uh, the same is true, actually, for food parcels for, for Jewish prisoners. That money came from Jewish organizations or governments, but very often from Jewish organizations like the Jewish Joint or, or other Jewish organizations. And they had to provide the funding or the parcels directly for these deliveries. The Red Cross was basically just delivering, making sure those parcels, those, those um, materials get to the camps because the Red Cross had access to these camps. And the other thing is... In addition to these food parcels, the Red Cross also had delegates. Delegates who were sent to prisoners of war camps and then later in some, in some cases also to concentration camps. And the job of the delegate was to supervise and to look if the rules of the Geneva Conventions are observed or not. It was both the delegates who kind of should make sure or at least control or try to see if, if the Geneva Convention was respected or not, and then the food parcels. So those were, were very important elements here. Yep. When they, when they um, push for reform the, for, of the Geneva Convention, they are actually widening their own role, making themselves uh, uh, more work, almost future-proofing their, their, themselves as an, as an organization, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was part of it. But uh, as I said, I mean, the urgency came with the Second World War and also the Holocaust, of course. But the idea of protecting civilians even started out earlier, even before the Second World War. But those projects could not be finished. And then the war broke out and everything came to a halt. And then after the war in 44, at the end of the war in 44, 45, they picked up the project again and uh, tried to bring it to a successful conclusion. It's interesting, of course, that 
the same project also helped the Red Cross to save its status as an international humanitarian organization, as the safe guardian of international humanitarian law and promoter of international humanitarian law, and to keep its unique status uh, inside the the Red Cross family. For, for, for all this um, almost seeking redemption towards the end, at the end of the war, they did speak out against the Nuremberg trials, which seems to fly in the face of, of all everything else, everything else they were doing. I mean, I have to say, uh, even the, the ICSC, the leadership of the ICSC was always Swiss. I mean, it's international in its activities, in its uh, reach, but national in its composition as, you know, as organization. The leadership was always Swiss citizens, always Swiss nationals, uh, between 20, 25 people in the leadership. And of course, 25 people have 25 different views, more or less. Yeah. And in my book, I've really focused on the leadership. I really focused on the president and the closest, the most powerful people in this leadership organization in the committee itself was running the organization so my focus is is really on these top people and looking at the president vice president and his closest uh, advisors and, and and colleagues they were certainly very much opposed of the nuremberg trials and denazification and war crimes trials in general because of their political views i think uh, they were very conservative. They were very afraid that communism would take over in Europe, would spread to Germany and beyond. And they thought that the war crimes trials and denazification are counterproductive and would only weaken Germany and open basically the gates for Soviet communist influence. So it was mostly political considerations of the leadership, especially Burkhardt who himself, who considered himself always a politician first, a man who wanted to be basically Secretary of State of Switzerland, yeah? But he was not running Switzerland, he was running the ICIC, and uh, that that um, caused some, some very um, problematic situations for him, but also for the, for the ICIC in Switzerland. Where they even found themselves defending some openly defending some uh, war criminals as well, didn't they, which I was surprised at. Yeah, they, uh, they were willing to testify in, in Nuremberg and talking about the actions um, of some of the, of the Nazi leadership and the SS uh, versus the end of the war uh, and the concessions those people made or allegedly made in order to allow more medical aid or other aid that the Red Cross could provide in the last months of the war to concentration camp inmates and others. And so the Red Cross was willing to testify in favor of some of these criminals because of what they had done or allegedly done to help the Red Cross in the final stages of the war. It just struck me as being a million miles from the neutrality policy that they'd been trying to tour for most of the war. We have to keep the timing in mind. Uh, I know it's complicated, but timing is crucial here. So I think in 1945, 1946, the situation of the ICSC was very weak. And Sweden was looking great, the other neutral nation in Europe. I mean, also the Swedish policy during uh, the Second World War was very similar and the actions very similar to Switzerland. After the war, Sweden was the humanitarian hero. Everybody loved Sweden the neutral, the good neutral, and the Swiss, they were the bad neutrals, and nobody liked the Swiss, basically. Things changed. In 47, 48, the Cold War uh, was decisive. Communism, Soviet Union, was seen as an enemy of the West, and the support for the for the Red Cross uh, got stronger and for supporting its role. Uh, yeah, presumably that's with American backing. With American backing, yeah. And that also explains that these issues of, you know, issuing travel documents for war criminals or people who had a problematic background or were Nazis or fascists whatsoever, starting by the end of 47, 48, did not play such a major role anymore. At that point in time, the Americans, also the Americans, were eager to end denazification, to end war crime trials, to wrap them up quickly 
and to get it over with and to move on. So uh, what could have been a big major problem for the ICSC in 1945, 1946 was not a big major problem anymore in 47, 48. Yeah, it, 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 it's a very fast moving um, political situation at the end of the war, obviously, because the Cold War came on very quick. And it's strange how uh, how everything turned around so very, very fast. It fell out differently completely than anyone would have expected. You you touched upon the Swedes. What have the Swedes done to become so popular in the uh, uh, during the war that that the Swedes hadn't? Uh, one of the aspects of the book that I personally <laughs> find most interesting is this competition between Sweden and Switzerland. And uh, symbolized in in the competition also of two men uh, between Kalyakopoka, I mentioned him earlier as the president of the ICSC and very ambitious politician at the same time, and uh, for Switzerland basically, and Folke Bernadotte, who was the president of the Swedish Red Cross for Sweden. So it was a competition between these two countries, but also between these two men and between these two Red Cross organization. So who was the better humanitarian during the war? Who did the better job? Who was the better neutral? And that was a fierce competition. And those nations and those governments uh, realized uh, it's going to help them to to improve their standing, their reputation with the allies once the war is over. So this was a fierce competition. It's very interesting to look at that, how humanitarianism was used also, not only, but also as a tool of foreign policy. When I was reading that, I wondered if it was easier for the Swedes. I might be wrong here. I never really fully followed the train of thought. If it was more difficult for the Swiss because they're fully surrounded, where the Swedes... The Germans still relied on the Swedes for, is it iron ore and coal or something? They had at least some leverage with the Germans uh, that perhaps the Swiss never had. So the Swedes could take more liberties, perhaps? Maybe, but Sweden was basically also surrounded. Norway was occupied by German forces. Sweden, uh, Finland was a German ally in the war against the Soviet Union. And then, of course, south uh, of, of, of Swedish border, there was Germany. So the position was, was similar. I think uh, the difference is in timing again. Sweden reacted and gave in to Allied pressure, and the Allied pressure was enormous after 1943-44. And the Allies said, we ha you have to cut off your ties with Nazi Germany. You have to stop delivering these goods. You have to stop doing this and that. And on the humanitarian front, you have to help these uh, civilian victims, these concentration camp inmates, these refugees. You have to do more. You have to engage more in rescue operations. This became then really, really important with the foundations of with the foundation of the World Refugee Board in '44 in the United States, where there was for the first time a government organization dedicated to rescue the Jews of Europe, basically, and other civilian victims. And and those organizations, they put a lot of pressure on the Red Cross, the ICC, but also the Swedish Red Cross, another neutral country, another humanitarian organization from a neutral country who could operate, who could still talk to the Germans. And, and Sweden reacted earlier, started earlier with rescue operations, already in 43, and with more determination, and with more success, and the ICSC and the Swiss came much later. So in, in some ways, one could say uh, Sweden, you know, stole the, the show, basically. And uh, the Swiss came too late, and their results were were limited. And Fulke Bernadotte, who was very prominent in Sweden, of course, as a member of the royal family, uh, he his wife was American. He had very good connections in the United States, and and uh, as president of the Swedish Red Cross, he achieved quite a lot. I mean, the rescue operations with the white buses, but also saving the Danish Jews, almost all of them, to Sweden 
those rescue operations were significant and uh, very well known at the time. And uh, Sweden, of course, did not lose any time to publicize those those efforts and those results and those successes. So if you go to Yad Vashem, for example, today, that's the Holocaust Memorial Site and Museum and Research Center in Israel, um, in Jerusalem, you have Sweden very prominently displayed as a rescuer nation. You have the white buses, the famous white buses with those buses, thousands of Jews were rescued in the last weeks of war and brought to safety to Sweden by the Swedish Red Cross. They are prominently displayed in Yad Vashem. Uh, Wallenberg, everybody knows Raoul Wallenberg, another Swedish uh, rescuer um, who helped uh, thousands of, of Jews in Hungary, is very prominent. The square in front of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is named after Raoul Wallenberg, and he's the only foreign national who is honored with a name, uh, you know, a square named after him on the on the mall in Washington, D.C. So Sweden is clearly on the record in the memory of the Holocaust as the rescue nation. Was the Swedish Red Cross as hand in glove with the Swedish government as the Swiss uh, Red Cross? The Swedish Red Cross was very much in line with the Swedish government and vice versa. I mean, the best example, again, is Jorge Bernadotte himself. He's a member of the royal family, Sweden. And he's at the same time vice president first and then president of the Swedish Red Cross. And he has many other functions and he has many other uh, titles. He's the head of the Swedish Boy Scouts, for example, at this point in time. And because of his prominence, he's really the star. He's the superstar in 1947, 1948. 1946, of international humanitarianism. Wallenberg was hardly known at the time. Nowadays, many people know Raoul Wallenberg and they don't know Volker Bernadotte. But those years, it was the very opposite. It was the other way around. Everybody knew Volker Bernadotte. He was all over the place. And it's not surprising that the United Nations, who were just formed and came into existence in those years, picked him as the first emissary for peace, basically, to the Israel-Palestine conflict. So why did the Swedes not end up as the as, as the centre of the International Committee for the Red Cross over the Swiss? Why did they, why did they, uh, you know, uh, why did it not change? I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, they didn't have the tradition. They were not traditionally, not legally the promoter and the safeguardians of the Geneva Convention was the ICSC. So they didn't have neither the legal basis nor the experience doing those kind of things. Uh, and the Swiss or the ICSC, they had that. And they already had a project on the table. Sweden was not prepared for that. People were asking for Sweden. They were uh, thinking of Bernadotte. And Bernadotte himself you know, envisioned him as being a leader also when it comes to the Geneva Convention, and maybe even one day the Swedish Red Cross could replace the ICSC as the flagship of international humanitarianism under the Red Cross, but that did not materialize. And uh, one reason is also in '48 when um, Bernadotte was asked to uh, play this important role in the context of the United Nations as being, you know, an emissary or envoy. Uh, for peace uh, in Palestine, Israel, and negotiate there, he very quickly lost interest in the whole Red Cross business. He he was a uh, it's, personality is key. He wanted to be important. He wanted to have success. He wanted to be in the international spotlight. And and once the Red Cross did not offer him that anymore so much, he left that and moved on. And, and then uh, Sweden was gone. He was murdered in 1948. And, and, and then uh, Sweden uh, basically uh, disappeared from, from, from uh, that forum. I mean, with the long lens of history, how, how well do you think the Red Cross performs during the war? When, when you look at the First World War, there's no doubt about it. Most historians would say this was an outstanding achievement. It, it proved that these ideas, these 19th century ideas of humanitarianism, neutral humanitarianism, had a place and could really make a difference uh, in protecting 
soldiers and wounded soldiers and prisoners of war also then, I don't think you can say the same for the Second World War. The Second World War ended with the question if 19th century humanitarianism as envisioned, you know, in the Red Cross movement still has a future. After the genocides and ethnic cleansing, the mass bombings of civilian targets, extermination camps, concentration camps, the death of millions of prisoners of war, for example, Soviet prisoners of war, also German prisoners of war in Soviet captivity, that did triggered a real serious crisis of Red Cross humanitarianism. It was not just an institutional crisis of the ICSC, it was really much wider. Even the president of the American Red Cross asked himself the question, is there still a future for organizations like us based on those humanitarian principles dating back to the 19th century? And in 1945 and 1946, these Red Cross leaders were not sure if the answer would be yes or no. The situation was completely different after the First World War. The answer was yes, yes, yes. It was very much the first war in, in some terms, a classical war where, uh, you know, men men stood in fields away from civilization and, and, and uh, fought it out as opposed to uh, the Second World War, which was... Uh, but still, even, even in the First World War, with extreme nationalism in Europe and beyond, uh, principles like neutrality and independence could easily be challenged, one would think, no? If it does not matter, like this idea that the Red Cross is based on is basically Christian, Jewish, mercy and, you know, neutrality. Good Samaritan. I help everybody. It doesn't matter if it's enemy, friend, you know, whoever, unknown person, you know, stranger. I am there for every... I'm blind. I see only the suffering of the people and I help. This is the idea. This is the ideal of the Red Cross. And in the, in the time, in the age of extreme nationalism, like First World War, it's for me still surprising that that kind of more or less still worked. You asked me at the start what, I've, what you think I got out, felt I got out of the book. What I felt I got out, what I found particularly interesting is how impossible uh, any organization is to remain neutral or, or the difficulty rather the impossibility to remain neutral because neutral becomes a real, uh, very much a, a strange scale uh, that, that leans one way and then the other. It's a hopeless situation in some respects. Yeah, I, I think one other thing that I thought, um, that I learned from the book is uh, that personalities matter a big deal. It really made a difference. Uh, you know, if you have Burkhardt at the leadership of the ICRC uh, or Max Huber, or Paul Rücker, and uh, if you have a Volker Bernadotte and the head of the uh, Swedish Red Cross, I think personalities really make a difference. And then to to take a closer look, I mean, an organization, there are always many people. And there were, were a number of people inside the ICSC who were not happy with the decisions made by the leadership, but their leaders, basically, the president and the, his closest advisors, and it's thanks to these people, actually, that the Red Cross, uh, although it decided not to speak out and not to provoke Germany and to keep kind of calm and, uh, or, or very careful and, and very cautious, yeah, uh, they, try, they, they decided, these lower-ranking people, so to speak, who had less influence and power in the ICSC, that they should at least attempt practical aid to send to attempt to send food food parcels in certain camps or certain ghettos to at least give some relief to do something at least and it's thanks to those people that those things were attempted and then at the end of the war 44 45 uh those um those attempts then um started to make a difference but it was not so much the leadership who decided that but like the lower ranking figures so to speak and that's something to keep in mind that it's not the ICSC or the Red Cross. Uh, and it's always important to take a closer look. And my book is, I tried to make it clear, is really about the leadership, the top people and their decisions and what they did. Yeah, so History from the top 
once in a while, sometimes uh, I try to make this resonate also. I have the voices and the actions of other people in these organizations who had a very different view. And, and you know, one should not forget the, the delegates that we mentioned. I mean, they did an outstanding job, delegates from the International Red Cross, like Friedrich Born, who was in Hungary, or uh, Swiss diplomats like Karl Lutz in Hungary. There were many, many, many delegates in place who saw the suffering, who were not sitting in Geneva, far away from the war in, in a neutral country, not very directly touched by the war. And they saw the suffering and they uh, did everything they could to help. And they were also part of that organization. However, it, had also, it also has to be said that many of these people did not get much in return. The organization did not thank them for their engagement. Only much later they were recognized for what they did. But I mean, the uplifting thing is you see in 44, once, of course, it has to do with the development of the war and where the, where the war is going, but also the, the pressure by governments who have specific offices in place, like the War Refugee Board, starting in 44, beginning of 44 in the United States. And these offices, and, and or the government through these offices, then really were able to uh, have an impact and to change politics of these neutral countries. post data really, isn't it? They could really apply pressure. Apply pressure, but this pressure often started with non-government organizations, with Jewish NGOs, with Christian NGOs, who put pressure on their government, say, you have to do something. You know, one of those results was the World Refugee Board, and thanks to that, the United States uh, uh, could could uh, put pressure on these neutral countries to do more uh, in the humanitarian area for victims of the Nazi regime and the other fascist regimes in Europe. Mm. Well, I, I think that seems like a good place to leave things. Thank you. Gerald's new book, Humanitarians at War, The Red Cross in the Shadow of the Holocaust, is available now. You'll find a link on the website. If you go poking about the website, you'll find I've added an Amazon bookstore highlighting many of the books and authors we've chatted to. Hopefully, it should make it easy for you to find some new reading material, whilst at the same time supporting the show by ordering via the World War II podcast Amazon store. Don't forget, you can also find me on Facebook. If you give the show a like, you'll find I post regularly things related to the latest episode. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and it gave you some food for thought. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.